Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. For it's time to talk about end stage kidney disease, the next edition of our wildly popular virtual expedition series. My name is Kevin Radomski, and I'm the Director of Events and Community Relations at the University Hospital Foundation, which includes planning our largest fundraising event of the year, the 2021 Festival of Trees. Our cause this year is kidney care, and I'll be the first to admit that up to about six months ago, I didn't know too much about kidney disease and next to nothing about life on a dialysis machine. But since then, I've heard stories from patients. I've heard from the experts who you'll be speaking with today, and I can tell you that it's a tough life. It's a challenge every minute of every day. But we're not here today to make you feel sorry for the people with kidney disease. We're here to tell you that we have some of the best and brightest nephrologists and medical teams in Canada at the University of Alberta Hospital. And they have a plan that with your help can make life better for patients. So thank you for joining us to learn more about this condition that is far more impactful than I ever would have imagined. And I hope that we can count on you for your support during the 2021 Festival of Trees. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Carolyn Thompson, who will guide us through today's event. Carolyn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kevin, and hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual expedition. Today's topic on kidney, on kidney care has generated quite a bit of interest with over 300 people registered for today's session. So as you heard, my name is Carolyn Thompson, and I'm the Director of Philanthropy here at the University Hospital Foundation. I would like to first acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First People of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Today's session is being recorded and we will send the link to everyone who has responded to this invitation over the next few days. And we certainly enc encourage you to share that with family and friends. You should see a question and answer or a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please submit your questions here and we will answer as many as we can during our Q&A session. Now, those of you who have joined us before will know we call these expeditions. And that's because we take you on a journey through the many amazing areas of care at the University of Alberta Hospital site. And they are guided by some, some of the truly incredible people who work here. I would now like to introduce you to one of our very own incredible people, Lisa Monroe. Lisa is the Chief Development Officer of the University Hospital Foundation, who will get us started on this expedition. Lisa? Thanks, Carolyn, and it's a pleasure to be here today, and exciting to see so many of you interested in hearing more about our cause for this year's Festival of Trees. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about one of our patients that Kevin referred to earlier in his opening remarks. Tarn was a young single mom living on her own with her baby when she was told that she had end-stage kidney disease and needed dialysis to stay alive. She had no idea she was so sick, and in fact, she refused to believe it. She initially ignored the diagnosis and carried on with her life as best she could. Her condition soon worsened. She ended up in hospital for nearly a month and has been on dialysis for two decades ever since. She had to hand over the care of her child to her parents. She had to leave school and was unable to work. However, her story is one of triumph. It's a story about what can happen when you get the right care at the right time. Tarn accepted the relentless routine of in-hospital dialysis and dutifully showed up four days a week for four hours of treatment per session. And as she adjusted to her new reality, she slowly began to get her strength back. Tarn started taking classes again, and after graduating from college, she got a job in her chosen field. She then met her husband, who quickly became a strong support system for her. They fell in love and have just celebrated their 11th wedding anniversary. And best of all, her daughter is now home with them. Donors to the University Hospital Foundation have played an important role in Tarrant's story. Several years ago, longtime friends of the University Hospital Foundation, Matt and Betty Jean Baldwin, made an incredible donation that opened the doors to expanding the home hemodialysis program. Their generosity also ignited research into making the program more accessible to people on dialysis and marks a significant turning point for patient care. The experts you will hear from today are going to tell you about advancements in kidney care and how your support will contribute to the West End Kidney Care Facility. But before, before we hear from our guests, 
we'd like to take a moment to tell you about who the University Hospital Foundation is, what we do, and most importantly, why we do it. The University Hospital Foundation wants to help people live longer and stronger lives, especially those who are seriously ill or injured. As agents of hope, we boldly seek solutions to, to seemingly insurmountable challenges, matching the determination and intensity of the medical teams that we support. Over the past 10 years, generosity from individuals and our corporate partners has contributed nearly $220 million towards bringing some of the best care in the world to our hospital site. Our hospital delivers services to patients who are facing life-threatening brain, cardiac, transplant, gastrointestinal, and urologic conditions, to simply name a few. Through our donors, we provide our medical teams with the technology, equipment, and ongoing financial support to advance patient care. We create new knowledge and make breakthrough discoveries that will change lives now and for generations to come. Well, I'd now like to introduce our two special guest speakers. Dr. Kalish Jindal is the Medical Director of Alberta Kidney Care North and a professor in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology at the University of Alberta. And with him is Sandy Vanderzee, who's the Executive Director of Alberta Kidney Care North. We're so happy to have the two of you with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Sandy. Great. Thanks very much, Lisa. And good afternoon to everyone that's joined us. I would also like to uh, welcome you to our virtual expedition today where we will be exploring the work that we're doing in Alberta Kidney Care, our services and programs. I'd also like to thank the University Hospital Foundation for inviting Dr. Jindal and I to join you today. It's a wonderful pleasure to speak to you about our programs and our new dialysis center, the West Edmonton Kidney Center. Next slide, please. So just a bit of an introduction to Alberta Kidney Care. We are a provincial program now. At one time we were separated north and south, but we are provincial and we have two branches, Alberta Kidney Care North and Alberta Kidney Care South. And you will see that we love our acronyms, I'm afraid. So we do provide care to patients throughout their entire journey with kidney disease. We have a wide variety of programs and we have uh, standardized things provincially so that patients receive the same care, whether they're in a big city or whether they're in a small rural area. We do have a lot of different types of clinics that are tailored to meet specific patient needs at different times in their kidney disease. And so we have um, prevention initiatives to try to keep people uh, off of dialysis. We have home programs where patients can do their own treatments at home. We, have, um, we provide a lot of training and education to patients' families. We also have an education center for new dialysis nurses. Uh, and service workers at the West Ed Kidney Center. So it's a very busy place. We have a number of uh, hemodialysis units, both in the cities and in a wide variety of rural areas. And we also have conservative care. And um, we are, the, you know, we really aim our work at meeting the clinical care needs of people living with kidney disease in all stages and also with their families. Next slide, please. This is a, sorry, this is a bit of a busy slide and you may not be able to see the map terribly uh, clearly, but we have uh, in Alberta Kidney Care North, we are the blue stars and we cover everything from Red Deer, including Red Deer North uh, to the Northern boundary of the province. We also do support some patients in uh, uh, Nunavut and uh, the Northwest Territories as well. So the blue stars uh, have a circle around them and that indicates a 100 kilometer radius around that center. We do try to have dialysis units and clinics within 100 kilometers of most of the population. Of course, we can't um, cover everything in the province, but that just should, that's what those circles are for. And uh, the Northern program, as you can see from this, the, uh, that we are a larger program than in the South, but we, we work uh, together collaboratively. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. We do an annual report and we circulate it every year so that our partners know uh, where we're at, what we're doing, what if we're improving or if we have challenges in particular areas. So I just want to really focus on the top left box, our home-based therapies. You'll see that our peritoneal dialysis rate, and uh, Dr. Jinda will explain a little bit about these therapies later, uh, has increased and we're better than the national average, which we're happy about that. Our home hemodialysis rate has also increased. And we 
want to increase even more. So our provincial um, average right now is about 28 to 29 percent. But we are targeting by uh, 2025 to have 40 percent of all patients requiring dialysis to be on a home therapy. We really do believe that home therapies are better for patients, gives them a lot more independence and control of their dialysis. And we're finding more and more that people are interested in this. And then just in the bottom left-hand corner, just talk a little bit about Connect Care. We are, Connect Care is our provincial electronic health record that you've likely heard a lot about, and it is rolling out. We've completed three waves now, and the third wave uh, involved a couple of our rural dialysis units, uh, Grand Prairie and Peace River. So there are a number of waves for us to go through before all of our programs will be completely on Connect Care. And the beauty of Connect Care is no matter where you're, you are in the province, if you have an accident or you become ill, your healthcare providers in a different center will be able to um, find out what your allergies are, what your medications are, that kind of thing, so that they'll have a truer picture of, uh, of your condition and how they might best treat you. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jindal and we're gonna go back to university for a little while and, and uh, have a little bit of education. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, the kidney disease changes people's life, especially when they are told that they have end-stage kidney disease or close to needing dialysis. However, there are lots of myths. Next slide. People think kidney disease is not that common. In fact, almost one in seven Canadians have some form of kidney disease. It's the 10th leading cause of death in Canada. The most common cause of kidney disease include diabetes and hypertension. And these are type of diseases which if managed properly, you can prevent kidney disease as well as you can slow down the progression of kidney disease. At the University of um, <clears throat> Alberta Hospital, as well as in the Alberta Kidney Care, we do quite a number of research projects in focusing on patients with diabetes and hypertension so that we can prolong we can prevent the development of kidney disease, or if people have kidney disease, we can slow down the progression. The kidney disease is also common in First Nations. So we have research projects that we conduct to detect early kidney disease, to slow down the progression of kidney disease in First Nations. About 8% of patients um, get kidney failure from what's called a glomerulonephritis, which is an inflammation of the kidney. And fully 18% of patients, we often do not know what started their kidney disease because kidney disease is silent and they present in late stages. And that's what is the big challenge. Patients suddenly present and we told them that they need dialysis or transplantation, which is a very um, traumatic event for the patients. And kidney disease and heart disease often occur together. And in prevention, the dietary management, nutritional management, salt restriction, all work together for both kidney disease and heart disease. And people don't realize that the kidney patients being treated for kidney failure have become much more common. It's three times increase in the last two decades. Next slide. Kidneys are our body's filter. When we metabolize protein and other food items, we create waste and the kidneys remove the waste and toxins. They also remove extra fluid. So waste and toxin accumulation can make us sick and extra fluid and salt retention can cause high blood pressure and heart failure. So dialysis, when kidneys fail, does that work for, for us. It removes the waste products as well as removed extra salt and water. In addition, kidneys also produce some important hormones. Erythropoietin is one of them. And lack of erythropoietin causes anemia in patients with kidney disease and causes them to feel fatigued and, and uh, tired. And we use artificially make hormone now for treatment. They also produce vitamin D, which uh, manages calcium and phosphate in the body. Next slide. When people are told they have advanced kidney disease and may need to go on dialysis or need transplant, that's a big traumatic event. Just like we heard the Karen story when she was told she was fairly advanced. People wonder what they will be do, whether they'll work, whether they can go to school, whether they'll be independent, whether they'll travel again, is my life over? So we are focusing on treatments that can maintain their independence and they can still work and go to school. So there are three kinds of treatments. Next slide. 
the most advantageous treatment for patients with end-stage kidney disease is a transplant. The transplant can be done from a living donor, whether it's a family member, friends, or even other living donors. It's the best form of treatment. Many times, if you do a kidney transplant, even before patient need dialysis, it provides the best quality of life. More importantly, kidneys obtained from living donors also last longer. But not everybody has living donors. We are doing important research in increasing the number of living donor kidneys um, in the Alberta uh, program. If there is no living donor available, then the patients have to wait for a deceased donor, which may take up to two to five years. And during this period, they will have to go on dialysis. There are two basic kinds of dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is a dialysis system where we use the person's own membrane in the abdomen to remove toxins and fluids. Uh, a tube is put in the patient's ab abdomen, and then once it heals, people can do dialysis at home. It's done in two ways, manually, about four or five times a day, or more commonly, people are using a machine at night, which can do four or five what's called exchanges. So it's every three or four hours, solution is put in the abdomen and then removed by a machine. And then sometimes in the daytime, they may carry a bag, but they can carry on with their work or school, or they can travel during that period. So that's a much more easier and better form of dialysis. It's one of the dialysis system which has advanced and our goal is to keep increasing the numbers. That's where the West Edmonton kidney care will come in. The second kind of dialysis is called hemodialysis, where blood is taken from the body. It goes to a artificial kidney called dialyzer and machine then returns the blood back. It can be done in a facility, just like West Edmonton Clinic or in hospitals. But ideally, the best quality of life is provided when it's done at home and patients are trained to do their own dialysis, especially if it's done at night where you can do five to seven nights a week where you do not accumulate salt and water toxins and it doesn't make you that sick. And our goal is to expand the dialysis both chemo and peritoneal dialysis at home. Now, some patients are very sick. Um, they have very fragile, they have advanced heart disease, or they may have a stroke, such that the quality of life on dialysis is poor and it does not necessarily prolong, prolong life for such patients. So we offer what's called a conservative care. Uh, education is provided to patients and families and, and we will let them know uh, how much advantage dialysis will be. Uh, and if they choose to do conservative care, we make arrangements with the home care and their family physicians to manage them so that they can still look after their symptoms. Next slide. Sandy. So this is where I come back. Um, our vision in Alberta Kidney Care is uh, to have a dialysis center that gives, provides excellent and innovative kidney care in a supportive person-centered environment. We're looking at promoting wellness versus illness, and we'd like to promote patient independence and self-care. And all this really is designed to focus on what the individual patient's needs are. So what we're trying to do in the West, Ed West Edmonton Kidney Center is to streamline services. Rather than telling patients, well, you have to go here for this and you have to go there for that education, but you go to this different building uh, in a different part of the city to, uh, for a clinic visit, et cetera, et cetera. We would like to bring all of our uh, dialysis services under one roof uh, for patients that are located in uh, Edmonton. I'd like to once again acknowledge the work that the University, Hos University Hospital Foundation has done for us. Um, they have really helped us to uh, provide uh, services to patients, to provide the right care in the right place at the right time, and we just are so appreciative of that. Next slide, please. So things that we hope to accomplish and we are working on now is the, the dialysis center in the West Edmonton Kidney Clinic is an extension of the University of Alberta Hospital. And um, we have a hemodialysis unit there on the main floor at this time, and it's running to pretty much full capacity. So it's been an opportun opportunity to us, for us to have more space for our patients. So we've got improved infection prevention. It's a really pleasant environment. Um, 
There's more privacy for our patients. So it's really improving the patient and family experience. It's really uh, given an opportunity for patients to have increased independence and quality of life. And um, I believe that Klosh is going to be mentioning a little bit about our independent hemodialysis program that we're hoping to initiate soon. As I mentioned earlier, it's a training session center. We provide education to patients, but also to their families. When people want to train on home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, we welcome families or a close friend that is willing to be a support person for them. This is a great place for research and innovation. I think we really have the greatest nephrologists, managers, and staff on our teams. And we've also partnered with the University of Alberta to um, do some research work. Uh, and some of the, the professors at the university are very interested in uh, research in the way of renal care and making patients' lives better. We have improved, I believe, that patient accessibility. We have, um, our location there is 170th Street and Mayfield Road. It's in a great place where we can offer free parking. And I will say that even parking for patients and families that come to dialysis, many of our places charge for parking. I know parking at the University of Alberta Hospital where I'm located is quite expensive. And when you're coming three times a day, you have to buy it at three times a week and you're staying four or five hours, you need to usually buy the full day. And uh, for patients who are financially uh, disadvantaged find this quite a struggle. So there's free parking there. If families come, there's lots of um, shopping around in the area, lots of restaurants that they can go to while they're waiting for their loved one to have their treatment if that's what they choose. And uh, we wanted to move out of the acute care system. Often when you go into a hospital facility, you right away get the impression I'm sick. Um, and while our renal patients do have a kidney disease, we want them to focus more on wellness, if at all possible, and um, the things that they are able to do and, and live their lives to the best uh, quality possible. Next slide, please. So I have a couple of pictures here. On the left, you can see a picture of our home hemodialysis unit that's at the Aberhart Center. The Aberhart Center is a very old building that's located on um, the campus here at the University at Walter McKenzie campus. You can see that it's very crowded. You can see the nursing desks there. I think there's three computers there. Um, if you look into the background, you'll see the nurse, the, the patient stations. They're located around the outside periphery of the unit. There's not too much privacy. There's curtains that separate them, but of course, with just with the curtains, you can hear, everyone can hear everything that's being said. So that's the current unit. And we want to move that unit and our peritoneal dialysis programs to the second floor of the uh, West Ed Kidney Center. And um, the, the picture on the right is what it looks like now. We have these little, um, I don't know if you'd call it a pod, but each patient has their own semi-private area. There is glass at the top there so that um, the nurses can visualize the patient in case there's any problems, but it gives them an opportunity for privacy. We have space there for our um, computers for Connect Care. You can see the computer coming from the wall. We also have space for families and friends to visit and they're welcome to come and visit during treatment. So it gives more of a private um, area. Plus if the doctor or the, or the uh, nurse needs to talk to the patient about something confidential. It's not um, vocalized throughout the entire unit, which our patients really appreciate that, uh, that privacy in their own space. And often we have patients that like to be together. So we can uh, put two patients across from each other so that they can still visit and talk because our patients have a great way of networking with one another and that's a wonderful support for our patients. Uh, next slide, and I will turn it over to Dr. Jindal to talk a little bit about research and innovation. So in addition to some of the research projects I mentioned in terms of preventing kidney disease and slowing down the progression of kidney disease, as well as the research in <clears throat> the First Nations, there's a number of pro research uh, that are being done in the dialysis unit itself. I've just listed a few of them. In clinical trial of incremental dialysis, traditionally dialysis is started, hemodialysis started three times a week. But when patients start dialysis, they often still have some kidney function. So sometimes patients can get away with doing dialysis only twice a week. However, 
<clears throat> it sucks that if you do that, then they may have more toxins and more salt and water retention. So we are doing a clinical trial where we carefully monitor, start them on twice a week dialysis, monitor their volume and toxins. And then if they're doing well, then continue them on twice a week. That is the less load on them. And in the meantime, we can educate them about dialysis at home as well as independent dialysis. The other research that is being done na nationally, which we are part of it, is the using different concentration of magnesium. Magnesium is a very important element. It affects heart. It also causes low magnesium causes muscle cramps. So we are testing low versus high magnesium to see if patients do better from a cardiac endpoint as well as from less <coughs> muscle cramps. So some patients are not able to do dialysis at home. However, they can be trained. So they may not have confidence or they may not have appropriate house where they can do dialysis. So in the West Edmonton Dialysis Center, we have six to eight machines, which will be kept for patients to do their own dialysis in the center, but doing it by themselves. So they will be trained just like they will be at home. There will be staff available to help if needed but patients can then do dialysis at home. And once they are ready and their confidence has come back, some of them will go home to do home dialysis. Now, traditionally in the hospital center, we have one nephrologist looking after the dialysis patients for at a month. Sometimes this lacks continuity of care for patients. So we are testing a new model of care in the West Edmonton Clinic, where one physician will be responsible for a group of patients and then physician will remain their patients as long as they stay on dialysis, providing better quality of life and better continuity of care for the patients. So these are some of the research projects I've listed, but there are several other projects we're doing in terms of research in the dialysis units. Next slide. So I would say there's an exciting opportunity on Horizon for Alberta Kidney Care North by opening this new dialysis center. Next slide. So the first floor is hemodialysis unit and we'll be starting the independent and self-care dialysis. And second floor, which will be expansion of the home dialysis programs, which will include the expansion of both home peritoneal dialysis as well as home hemodialysis. And as Sandy mentioned, it's more importantly, it's in a community setting rather than in a hospital setting. Next slide. So this will allow patients to use their knowledge and training to empower themselves to do more home therapies. Um, and the second floor will be used for teaching um, as well as educating patients and families. Next slide. So we want to help patients with end-stage renal disease to live the best of their lives. So this will be the first comprehensive renal center in Alberta where all modalities will be under one roof as Sandy already explained. The focus will be on wellness and independence, not just sickness. There will be ability to expand the growing need of these patients to choose home dialysis. Uh, we, our goal is to reach at least 40% of patients needing dialysis to be doing dialysis at home, whether it's home peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis. We will be using state-of-the-art machines and this, the unit is designed state-of-the-art to meet current standards. And they will continue to be a strong focus on the second education. So I'll go back to Sandy. Next slide, please. So we have really benefited from the support that the University Hospital Foundation has provided to us. And we have appreciated so, so much as well as our, our patients have really appreciated and benefited from it. And it's also helped us to facilitate uh, research, which we know does improve patient care. And our patients are of utmost importance to us and we want to provide the very best that we can. And we want to be leaders in the, in the country and uh, in internationally as well. And through the support of the University Hospital Foundation, we've been able to have the newest dialysis machines using the best technology available. We've been able to purchase equipment that our patients can use in their homes to make their lives easier and better. We, as Lisa mentioned, the Baldwin family provided us with a very generous donation, which has 
uh, given us the opportunity to train and educate more patients and send them home with the appropriate technology and to follow up and uh, to really expand our services that uh, more patients are to, can still uh, come for training. Next slide, please. But we really can't do this just by ourselves. We know that funding everywhere and money is tight everywhere, but we do need you. This year, we're really pleased that the University Hospital Foundation has chosen this home dialysis expansion at the West, Ed West Edmonton Kidney Clinic um, as their fundraising focus for the Festival of Trees. So I know that they have lots of great events planned, special events that uh, everyone will really enjoy. Next slide. So we need you to help us to make this dream a reality for our patients. And we really hope that you will consider partnering with us to accomplish this dream. If there's anything that we can do to provide additional information to you, we're more than happy to do that. And in the long run, our patients will benefit by having the opportunity to uh, be at home, to dialyze at home, to travel more, to be more independent if, they, if that is something that they would like to do. Next slide. So Dr. Jendel and I would like to thank you for letting us share our work and our story with you and our dreams for the future. And we really appreciate your time today. Next slide. So we'll have an opportunity now for questions or comments. I'm sure that Dr. Jenda will answer all the difficult questions and I'll take the, the easy ones. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jindo, uh, for your very enlightening presentation. Like everyone here, I am very excited to hear more uh, during our Q&A session. My name is Prince Osei. I'm a member of the development team here at the University Hospital Foundation, and I will be your moderator for the question and answer period of this very exciting uh, expedition. For our um, audience, right at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Please submit your questions in here, and I will do very well to get to them. But we did have a few questions submitted in advance. Um, so I will do my very best to go through as many questions as possible uh, during the time that we do have left. And so my first question goes to you, Dr. Jindal. Um, why is end-stage kidney disease so difficult to diagnose? Yeah, so kidney disease is very silent. Often um, no symptoms occur until kidney function is that often less than 10%. I've seen patients presenting when kidney function was 5% and they had no indication because it's silent. However, there are some diseases where kidney disease is common. As I mentioned, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. If there is family history of kidney disease, especially polycystic kidney disease. So that, those are the circumstances which allow us to do blood and urine tests to detect kidney disease early when patients have underlying diseases which can result in kidney failure. So our research is focused on doing early testing in high-risk patients so that we can detect it early so we can slow down the progression of kidney disease. So that's why, especially patients with diabetes and kidney disease and heart disease should get regular checkups and get their urine and blood tests done. And I think our kidneys are really amazing organs. Um, you know, when they start to fail, though, they compensate and they compensate and they compensate. Like Dr. Jindal mentioned, people often don't know. And then once suddenly the person is not feeling well, and then they're often diagnosed. So our kidneys are amazing things that they, they try to keep going and keep going as long as they possibly can without complaining too much. Ah, so, um, Sandy, my, my, there's a question here that I'm directing at you. What is the cost to set up a patient at home? I'm thinking this is a home hemodialysis. Oh, that's a good question. And I should have checked my numbers, but I think to send a patient home, it's probably in the range of about $35,000 uh, per patient. We, uh, for the, the home hemodialysis program, we provide them with a, an actual dialysis machine. And then there's ongoing costs. We provide all of the equipment. Uh, and the supplies that they need so that they don't have to pay for it themselves. The same thing with peritoneal dialysis and peritoneal dialysis would be significantly cheaper just to send them home, but they have the machine and the supplies that they need, usually a scale, blood pressure um, monitor and everything that they need to, to um, safely dialyze in their home. 
So peritoneal dialysis would be significantly cheaper just to send the person home, but there's still ongoing costs. And I would estimate to send a home hemodialysis patient home, it would be at least $35,000. And um, as a follow-up, is there dialysis available at a Sherwood Park Hospital? In Sherwood Park? No, there isn't. I wanted to have one in Sherwood Park at one time because I live in that area and I thought that would be a good place for me to uh, semi-retire, but uh, <laughs> there's no dialysis unit there. But there is one in the south of Edmonton at the Grey Nuns. Okay. Dr. Jindo, how do you determine who gets a kidney transplant and do they work for everyone? So first thing is that transplantation is still the best form of treatment. So we consider initially everybody to, to be evaluated. The only people who are not suitable for transplantation who have advanced blood vessel disease, if you have heart failure so bad that you can't get an operation, or if you have blood vessel disease where you cannot hook up a kidney, or you have some form of cancer because they are on immune suppression medication, the cancer can get worse. So if you can exclude all of those things, then the people are suitable for transplantation. And so what, what our goal is generally when we see people early, if somebody has kidney function of you know, 10 or 11% and we see them in time enough and they don't have any contraindications for transplant, as I mentioned, they don't have cancer, they don't have bad blood vessel disease. Our goal is to actually provide transplantation if we can, especially if they have a living donor so they never have to go on dialysis. So uh, one of our audience has typed, uh, Valerie is asking, uh, she has Sjogren's, I'm not pronouncing correctly. Sjogren's. Sjogren's, yeah. yeah. Fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia, high blood pressure and osteoarthritis. Do you get a lot of patients with so grants and do you also work with hospitals in rural towns, for example, Edson? Yeah, I first thing is Sjogren's is not a common disease. We do see some patients with Sjogren's and it can affect kidneys. And many times the kidney remains stable for a while, except for controlling blood pressure. And there are certain things when people have Sjogren's, they cannot manage their acid base properly. So sometimes we have to give them sodium bicarbonate, et cetera, et cetera. We do uh, see patients with Sjogren's and we manage them. I myself may have 10 or 15 patients with Sjogren's disease. And we do work in rural area. I go to do clinics in many rural areas. I go, I do a diabetic nephropathy clinic in Edson, as well as Hinton, Jasper. But I also look after dialysis unit and do rural clinics in St. Paul and get patients from Bonneville, Coal Lake. So we, we have a number of clinics in the rural areas. About uh, 15 or 18 years ago, uh, we established several clinics in rural areas so that the rural area patients can get similar services as in the uh, city. Uh, Jean is asking if you have signed a form allowing for transplantation at the end of life, do you contact family members prior to harvesting for consent? Is this a challenge when there are no family members locally and the closest members are cousins in the East? Yeah, it is a challenge. We actually encourage people to sign their uh, donor cards beforehand. So the best thing is for people to sign their donor cards. Uh, and so that then, then it's less challenging, even if if the person has signed the donor card and we can get it at the time, then even if they are not close family members, it can be better managed. So who are the biggest kidney donors? Where are you getting the, because I saw in Sandy's slide, I think last year, 189 transplants, kidney transplants were done. Where are we getting the organs? Oh. Yeah. So almost 30 to 35% are living donors. So most of them are family members. And what we have done between South and North, we have found that often we were taking a little longer to work up both donors and living donors. So we actually have a very exciting research projects where we are providing education to patients, families, and so, to let them know what, what's involved with donation so that they can come forward 
And it's a challenge for sometimes a patient to ask their family members. So we have these research projects where we would offer to provide the education ourselves. The patients don't have to ask their family members itself. And we are hoping that will increase the number of people who donate. Now, sometimes for living donors, you have to match, the, your immune system has to match the patients. We are also doing a system where if one patient's immune system does not match, then they can donate to another member and the another member can donate to this member. So it's called pooling and that also increases the donor. So we are increasing the pool, we are trying to increase the pool of donors for the living donor transplant programs. The rest of the, the disease donors come from accidents and somebody with brain hemorrhage, et cetera, et cetera. Stanley, Vic is asking, do you need volunteers at a Western facility to help? encourage read or chat with patients during their treatment? We always like to have volunteers. We do encourage people to join the volunteer uh, group at the University of Alberta Hospital and they've got a number of things that they go through and uh, yes uh, there are some patients that are, are really quite lonely and, and as one of our last uh, uh, individuals asking a question if they don't have family members here or even some close friends um, sometimes a visit is really in, um, beneficial. The Kidney Foundation also has a visitor program. It is a little more designed to be more peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, so that is another opportunity. But uh, yes, if someone's interested in, in volunteering, uh, that would be wonderful. And we would encourage them to contact the volunteer services here at the University of Alberta Hospital. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Ray is also asking, uh, do I have to buy the machine for dialysis? No, no, neither home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis do you have to buy the machine. That's one reason that we look towards our wonderful uh, foundation and donors to help us with this. They are provided with the machine, they're provided with the supplies, uh, they're provided with the, the things that they need to, to dialyze at home. For um, home hemodialysis, the one expense that they might incur is extra water on their water bill. And uh, some communities have decided that they're going to not charge that person extra money because um, they're you know, very humanitarian in their approach and they want their, their um, community members to stay in their own community. So that's a wonderful thing, but that is likely one thing that they might experience. However, that's a real trade-off because if you have to drive 100 kilometers to the nearest dialysis unit, you're going to save on, you know, gas and mileage and meals out. If you, you know, parking at the hospital, you're going to say you're going to save in some ways as well. But no, we provide everything that is needed for the actual dialysis. And we provide all the training and we provide a, a renal technologist that works with the patients as well to help them to know what they're doing. And for home hemodialysis, we send um, a nurse and the renal technologist right to the patient's home to uh, be with them for their first treatment. So I think we, we try to smooth things out to make it as easy as we can for, for patients and their families. Thank you. Dr. Jindal, you have something to say? No, I was gonna say that there's also, uh, somebody's on call all the time for patients to uh, troubleshoot at home. So they're not just left alone at home. That's wonderful. Um, so agenda, this question goes to you. So would it be correct to say that the prevention of kidney disease is really focused on the primary cause, that is controlling diabetes or high blood pressure, rather than on the kidney as such? Yeah, so when uh, what happens with diabetes in the very early stages, kidneys become large, then they start to spill out some protein called albumin. So what has been shown that if you tightly control diabetes and particularly if you tightly control blood pressure and there's some new medications which can reduce the amount of protein or albumin coming out of the kidneys. And in that case, it's not just the diabetes, it's controlling blood pressure and some medications. You can prevent the kidney failure in diabetes and that's an, quite an exciting um, area right, right now. Yeah. Sandy. What can people do to avoid having to see you? Not an awful lot of people actually see me, at least not these days <laughs> with COVID. Um, so I think it, it ties into what Dr. Jindal's just said is to 
you know, um, maintain as healthy a lifestyle as you can, ensure that you, if you're diabetic, that you're, you know, maintaining um, strict glucose control, that you're controlling your blood pressure, uh, following up with your GP. And if you have kidney disease, one thing that I would suggest to patients is to, if their general practitioner uh, physician doesn't refer them to us, we would ask that they refer them as early as they can because we have clinics that we would like to get them into that we can really provide some expert care for. So I would say try to stay as healthy as you can. I'll just add to that. One of the things that often people neglect is the lifestyle measures. Uh, diet is very, very important in kidney disease. A simple thing like sodium restriction is extremely important. Uh, our diets with processed meat and processed foods are now such a high amount in salt, and that contributes to high blood pressure, increasing protein in the urine, and progression of kidney disease. So the clinics that uh, Sandy mentioned, that's the focus. So we have nutritionists and, diet, and dietitian and, and, uh, and nurses who focus on lifestyle changes first, and not just the medication. So that's one of the big important, because when you go to a family physician's office, uh, you know, sometimes it's, they don't have enough time to spend with you. But on the other hand, in these clinics, the dietitian and nurse can spend a lot more time and give you time for educating you about, about those lifestyle changes. And I will say that Dr. Gentle is a huge advocate for uh, salt restriction. Okay. And, um, and I mean, a huge advocate. And I remember a number of Christmases ago, we gave him a big box of salt and we put a lock around it and we gave it to him for, as a Christmas gift. So it was kind of a little bit satirical, but it was, we enjoyed it. Okay. Dr. Gentle, can you explain why and how kidney uh, problems are a major factor after heart attacks. Is there a correlation? Yeah, so heart attacks often are because of what's called atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. It's often a diffuse system. So, so the same hardening of the artery can occur in the kidney vessels, as well as people who have hardening of arteries also tend to have high blood pressure, which can also affect the kidney. And then if you have a bad heart attack and your heart pump doesn't function very well, the blood flow to the kidneys can be reduced. So high blood pressure, hardening of arteries and reduced blood flow all can lead to re re reduction in kidney function. So the kidney function can go down. So that's the link between the heart and the kidney. Thank you. Is there an age limit on family members who are eligible to be living donors? Uh, we don't have actually a numerical age limit. Um, you know, often people above 65, it will be difficult. They tend to have, you know, reduced kidney function naturally, but it depends on the health rather than a, a, a numerical number. You know, a healthy 60 year old with no blood pressure, no diabetes, no disease can be a donor. On the other hand, if somebody is unhealthy, 40-year-old might not be. So it's not, it's not totally dependent on a numerical age. So Sandy, for a person who is um, who a person with congenital kidney disease whose GFR is declining from 30 to 25 of the past year, what is the recommended daily sodium intake? Oh, can I turn that to Dr. Gentle, the sodium guru? Oh, okay. Yeah, so in general, you know, we should not eat more than about 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. That's kind of the Canada health guidelines. So in patients with kidney disease, whether it's diabetes or congenital disease, our recommendation is sodium between 1,500 and 2,000 milligrams a day. Colin wants uh, you to know, thank you for advocating for nutrition. Uh, uh, they're always happy to help clients in, 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 uh, in a healthy lifestyle. There's another question on when is uh, peritoneal dialysis used rather than hemp dialysis? And is it patient preference? Um, so if, if actually, if there are no contraindication, no operations in the abdomen, et cetera, and nothing, no adhesions in the belly or nobody, peritoneal dialysis is often preferred for many reasons. Number one, it's easier to perform. 
Number two, it's easy, shorter training. And number two, you don't have to do operations on the blood vessels in the arms, et cetera. And so it's the preferable form of treatment and it's also the least expensive and people do equally well than hemodialysis. So it will be a preferred unless there's a contraindication. I think another plus of it is that patients can, off, can travel more. Um, you know, you can put the equipment in your trunk of your car and away you go. Uh, we've had patients that have traveled around the world. I've seen, uh, I know of one patient who has dialyzed on a train in Europe and has been dialyzing while they're traveling on the train. So for people who really enjoy traveling, uh, I think that, um, Peritoneal dialysis is a wonderful option. Is it possible to exercise during dialysis and does this improve results of dialysis? Um, like pedal yes. Bikes? yes, we do have a dial, we have an exercise program. We have a number, we're really fortunate to have a number of kinesiologists within our program who are experts in exercise and dialysis. And um, it does help to build a person's stamina um, from some of the research that we understand that it also um, decreases falls and incidence of hospitalization. And um, I'll let Klosh speak to the medical part, but I think it also helps um, with the blood uh, supply, you know, um, uh, being evenly distributed through the body quickly. But uh, we, and we have exercise bicycles that have been donated to us as well. And we have used some of the, the funds from the University of Alberta Hospital Foundation to provide these exercise bicycles for people to dialyze while they're on treatment. And Klaus, do you have any, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a physician, but do you have any clinical indications that um, support uh, exercising on dialysis? Yeah, so some of the toxins are in the muscles, et cetera, and when people have kidney failure and the blood supply to these areas is reduced, when you exercise, the blood supply is increased. So more toxins are available to be removed on dialysis. So there is some research done which shows when you exercise more urea, which is one of the toxins is removed during dialysis. And we actually have a very, very aggressive now uh, exercise research program. One of our nephrologists is leading uh, in the exercise program. So she's looking at a number of uh, <clears throat> things, including blood pressure control, not just on dialysis, but she's doing research in early kidney disease in the clinics to see if there'll be better blood pressure control. And the, because there are some early studies which suggest the blood pressure control improves with exercise. And I think with exercise for any of us, you know, it's said to incru, um, release those endorphins and increase and improve your mood. Um, so I think that's another benefit. That is another benefit that patients have told us about. Our kinesiologists at the West Edmonton Kidney Center have also developed a, um, an online exercise class that you can, that patients can join. Um, so that's really a great initiative as well. And that's just something that's recently happened. And I believe it's primarily happening out of our, of the West Ed uh, Kidney Center. So Dawn is sharing that uh, she has a brother who has nephrotic syndrome. Have you seen a large number of those with this uh, disease eventually requiring a dialysis machine? So yeah, nephrotic syndrome is like a syndrome. So there are many causes. Some people have nephrotic syndrome, which can be completely cured. So it's not always the case. So some diseases like what's called minimal change disease with corticosteroids, they go into remission. So not all nephrotic syndrome will end up in end-stage renal disease. When you have nephrotic syndrome, what you do need to do is find the cause and then you treat the particular cause. Some of the conditions may not um, get better with treatment, but large majority get better so that people may not end up in end-stage renal disease. Ray is also sharing, Dr. Jindal, that his wife is diabetic and sometimes uses a little bit of salt on certain foods. Is there one salt better than others? No, the from a sodium point, sodium chloride point of view, all salts are very similar. So, you know, if you avoid processed foods, et cetera, which have a lot of sodium in it, um, small amount of sodium may come in the range of 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams. It's really, people don't realize 70 to 80% of the sodium in our foods comes from already prepared food. You know, if you have processed lunch meats and bacon, sausages, canned soups, pickles, you know, Chinese food, those are the big sources of sodium. If you avoid many of those, if somebody requires small amount of salt on their food, 
it may be within the range of say 1500 to 2000 milligrams. That's why it's helpful to talk to the nutritionist if you have disease or a dietitian who can help you. But there's also some very good websites. Sodium 101 is one good website where people can go on and actually find about foods that have less, less sodium. We have time for one more question. If you've, had, if you've had bowel surgery in the past for bowel cancer, can you still have peritoneal dialysis? Yeah, if you have bowel surgery, which was uncomplicated, there was no adhesions, nothing else, yes, people can do peritoneal dialysis. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, Dr. Jindal, Sandy. Um, this is all the time we have for our questions today. I will now give it back to my colleague, Caroline, to, for closing remarks. Well, thank you so much, Prince, and, and thank you to all of our audience members for submitting such um, thoughtful questions. And I think I can safely say we've all learned quite a bit today. So thanks so much. And, and now on behalf of the University Hospital Foundation, including Lisa, Kevin, Prince, Emily, and myself, and of course, our very, very special guests, Dr. Jindal and Sandy Vanderzee, thank you for your time and your very active participation. We hope you found today's session informative. And again, within the next few days, we'll send you a short survey. And so you can let us know how we did. Uh, we'll also be sending you the recording from today's expedition and do feel free to share that. And if you want to learn more about us, please reach out by email or visit our website at give to uhf.ca. You can also watch recordings from some of our past virtual expeditions on the University Hospital Foundation's YouTube channel. We will be taking a break from our virtual expeditions over the holidays, but please make sure to watch out for announcements on the next virtual expedition. As Lisa mentioned and Sandy mentioned, ongoing community support is vital to ensuring that the work of innovators like Dr. Jindal can improve health in the communities that we serve. Thank you for joining us today. And this concludes our formal presentation. I will leave you though with a short one minute video entitled Ignite 2030. Thanks everybody and have a wonderful evening.